Welcome and thank you for tuning in. You're listening to the Beyond 50 radio program. I'm Daniel Davis. On the program today, we're going to do a little bit of step into the future to discover just what is in store for us when it comes to things such as employment. On the Beyond 50 radio program today, guest is rejoining us here on the program who's going to be talking about 25 future trends that we should be keeping our eye on, which will cause what is known as super employment. Emerging trends help with things such as disrupting energies that will create that super employment that I was talking about, as well as what is known as disruptive innovations, which disrupt an existing industry, and catalytic innovations that have the ability to produce entirely new industries. Our guest is the Executive Director and Senior Futurist at the Da Vinci Institute, where he works closely with his Board of Visionaries to develop original research studies, which enable him to speak on unusual topics, translating trends into unique opportunities. I'd like to be on 50 Radio program today, our guest, Mr. Thomas Fry. Thomas, welcome back to the program. Hey, thanks for having me on. You know, I'm looking at some of these trends that we're looking here into the future. A, they're already here, so there's really not a whole lot anybody can do about it but adapt. Tell us what's going on here. Um, we're... We're actually having lots of jobs that are automated out of existence. There's uh, employers that are making conscious decisions today as to whether or not um, they need to hire a person or they can fulfill this task with a machine. And so that's, that becomes kind of an interesting dynamic. But the Internet is a very sophisticated communication tool and it's enabling us to align the needs of a business with the talent of individuals in far more precise ways than ever in the past. Um, so it's, it's very easy for a business, rather than to bring on a full-time employee, to bring somebody on for two hours or for two days or two weeks to, to do a task as opposed to bringing them on full-time as an employee. Um, so that's, that's uh, some of the changes that are happening around us. Now, it's fascinating. One of the big ones that's on the horizon, it's been interesting for me to talk with people about this, and that is that of 3D printing. Now, just a week ago, I believe it was, I was just catching on, uh, I guess it was cable television, and it seemed to be one of those things that's real quiet, but I found very fascinating, and that was the crew on the space shuttle. And they were simulcasting as they were talking with the crew out here in space, and they specifically talked about the 3D printer that they had on board. And they were excited at the possibilities as they were going to be using this. And one of the things they actually made while they were out there in space uh, was a there was a ratchet that they were able to make, and then the other one he talked about was a mason jar. And I was thinking, is anybody else paying attention to what's going on here with this new 3D printing that's going on? Yeah, 3D printing is actually going off in a thousand different directions. And literally, it's going to affect every one of our lives. Um, there are so many interesting possibilities with it. Uh, last week, I was out at CES in Las Vegas. And the first booth that we stopped at was with, with Harmon, uh, Harmon Carden. And they proceeded to set us down in a chair, and they scanned the inside of our ears, and then they were able to 3D print a, uh, an earplug that would go onto a set of headphones that's perfectly designed to fit the inside of our ear. Um, now that's an, really an interesting application, I think, because um, we're, we're able to do things that are very personalized in micro detail, uh, one-off things like this. Uh, later on, I, uh, I had my face scanned in so I could get my face um, printed uh, in a 3D printer and applied to a Captain America doll. So I have my own <laughs> personalized Captain America doll. Uh, and so I'm going to make everybody jealous now with that. <laughs> Can you imagine being your own favorite superhero there? And take a look. It looks just like me. <laughs> That's pretty exciting. And just to let the listeners know, when you were mentioning Harmon Carden, you're talking about the stereo uh, development company, right? Right. Uh, okay. They make real high-end audio gear, mm -hmm. and um, they've been around for years and years. But, but this is a very specific application. Um, uh, I mean, when you're able to scan the inside of the ear and then you cut off certain areas and, 
and then you make a an earplug that will will stay in your ear and not fall out when you're running and stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, that I think is is absolutely fascinating. Now you know, Thomas, when you think about super employment, and a lot of people look at the future of employment itself. People might be concerned, well, what if I don't jump on board or adapt to this? Do you see any particular kind of concerns looking in that particular paradigm, I suppose? Um, There's lots of jobs that are on the endangered list, if you will. Um, There's there's professions that are going to go away. Um, By 2030, we're, we're estimating in 2030, the average person will have to reboot their career six times. Wow. Um, and uh, so I've, I've made predictions that by 2030, over 2 billion jobs will disappear on the planet. Um, now that's not intended to be a doom or gloom statement. It's intended to be a wake-up call. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're not going to have 2 billion people unemployed, but we are going to transition jobs at a far faster rate than ever before in the past. And so how do we, how do we prepare for this? How do we gear up for it? Um, how do we create the jobs uh, of the future, and um, and who who are the winners and losers in the whole process? Uh, mm-hmm. Lots of interesting questions come out of that. Well, the other one too that's pretty big as well would be the future of education itself. Right. Um, so we're we're looking at this in a real interesting way because um, if you have to reboot your career six times throughout your lifetime. You want to do that in the least amount of time, not in the most amount of time. So um, traditional colleges are a very poor fit for this type of retraining because they're trying to fit everything into the framework of a two, two-year career uh, study or a four-year study. So this leaves a wide open gap. So we've been experimenting with what we call micro-colleges. Um, and at the Da Vinci Institute, we have a computer programming school called Da Vinci Coders, and in just 11 to 13 weeks, you can enter as a beginner and uh, and walk away getting an entry level job in uh, in the programming world. Um, so so that's we we're estimating that it takes roughly a thousand hours of proficiency, uh, and we don't keep you in a classroom for a thousand hours, but um, you need to spend a lot of time working on your own uh, in the programming world before you get proficient enough to get an entry-level job. Um, and that uh, quantifies it in a lot of people's minds. But we, we see micro-colleges going off in a thousand different directions as well. The, uh, um, the programming is a, a very hot area right now. It's something that's uh, clearly defined, uh, different languages you can teach. Um, but we also see areas like um, we're, we're going to be offering a gaming class, game design and development class. Um, we're going to, in the future, we plan to offer classes on flying drones, on um, things like how to design parts for 3D printers, um, and even go off into areas such as uh, how do you become a brewmaster for a brew pub or a dog breeder or um, become an expert on crowdfunding. There, there's lots of different areas where uh, micro-colleges, I think, come into play. And I, I think that's going to be a hot new industry that uh, a lot of people are going to jump on. Now, you were talking about software developers, and I was looking into this a little bit more, and it's pretty fascinating when you think about people who are already in the industry who know how to do this versus people who really don't approach this at all. They figure, well, that's for you know the smart people. But you're talking about people who are capable of learning these sort of things. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, we we give everybody a test, um, and it it's actually um, uh, pr- computer programming is not the the high math stuff that it was in the past. Right. It's it's um, pattern recognition, problem solving. Uh, requires some of those skills. It's actually much more creative than most people think. Um, and, and, and so if you have this idea that you're constantly looking at ones and zeros on a page, that's not the way it is because people can, can uh, write a few lines of code and then they can look at what, what it's doing on the page. And uh, it's, it's 
very very creative. You can create your own websites and create your own excuse me applications, and um, and they're functional, and you can people can use them, and that's very gratifying. You know, and what's really fascinating too, when you look at the birth of the internet, that actually changed a lot of things. Where a common person with really no software skill whatsoever, now as you were just saying, could develop their own website. I remember when we first started our program about 11 years ago, we deferred to somebody to build our website, and it was all HTML coding, and we couldn't seem to get this guy to understand, you know, sure, you can make this on the screen, but, you know, a website really is a an online business is what it is, and for some reason, developers didn't seem to understand that concept, and so things didn't, you know, they looked great, but it wasn't converting and doing what I was suggesting, but... I tell people now, you with no develop software development skill or HTML or any math whatsoever could go online, and there are so many companies out there that offer you the opportunity to build your own website. So it's just a matter of sitting down and taking one step at a time and, and just being able to do this. Uh, absolutely. Um, the reason changes are happening so fast in the world right now is that innovation is getting parsed into far smaller pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's enabling everybody to participate. Um, in, in the past, it was um, relegated to people working in large corporations, and, and there was uh, lots of gatekeepers and barriers in place that um, if you had a, a real creative idea, you just basically had nowhere to go with it unless you were extremely persistent. Now you can take that idea and run with it. Um, people can create a mobile app, as an example, in a few hours. In the past, that would take uh, could take months or years to actually complete that same uh, kind of task. But now you can have that mobile app finished and up online, and it's a product you're selling um, in less than a day. Hmm. Um, that's new and different. And so when we, we have technologies like the Internet of Things um, with 3D printers, um, uh, when, when people have access to 3D printers, they can design their own prosthetic limbs. We can have people design their own cases for their smartphones. We can have people design chess pieces that they can play on their the next game of chess they're playing with their friends. Um, this is this is new and different. So creativity is getting pushed out to the edges, and everybody gets to participate. I think too, uh, just to really give people perspective, is uh, my wife one time brought home a television series that I'd never heard of before, and since watching it, I tell people this is something you really got to see, and that's the television show Eureka. Are you familiar with that? Oh, yes, yes. You know, and there was a particular episode where one of the, I guess, call them innovators, doctors, directors, whatever you want to call it, she had actually died, and what had happened is they found a way to basically print a whole new body, and then the programmer, a guy that was really, you know, the supercomputer programmer, was able to integrate her consciousness into this 3D printed body, so they were really literally recreating her. And I thought, wow, what are the possibilities, and does something like that exist now? Um, I, I actually wrote a column on that, um, on that topic a while back of how long will it be before we can actually 3D print a replacement body for ourselves. Um, we are printing organs and pieces of organs and um, you know, pieces of livers and kidneys and things like that. Um, it's it's moving along very quickly. We still haven't mastered. Uh, if somebody gets their finger cut off, as an example, we still can't re print a replacement finger for them and attach it and have it working. But I think that's just a matter of time um, before somebody figures that out. But if we could actually print a replacement body for ourselves in it. My guess is it'll probably be some combination of printing and cloning and a few other sciences we haven't invented yet. Um, but then, is uh, is it possible to actually transfer our consciousness into uh, this new body? Um, by the way, I'm getting a little older, and I 
would like uh, about a 20 year old body, something that looks really good, um, <laughs> pre- pretty muscular. With the that Captain America costume, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, why not? <laughs> now, it was funny because I was looking over the mobile apps and uh, a couple of things they were talking about were next generation apps for things such as smart shoes, smart homes, smart guitars, and much more. And I thought, what is a smart shoe? Yeah, um, there's, uh, I actually wrote a column on that a while back too, but um, there's different ways of, of thinking about what a smart shoe could do. Um, uh, so part of what I was thinking in the past is that you could have uh, there's this expanding polymeric gel that if you run electrical impulses into it, expands or contracts accordingly. And uh, having cells that are in the bottom of your shoe, you could adjust so that you have even pressure on the bottom of your foot wow. uh, as you're walking or running. Um, that's a fairly sophisticated thing that hasn't come out yet. But having... Uh, flaps on the side of your shoes that would open and close depending on what the temperature is of your of your foot that could open the ventilation and allow more air to flow through. Um, uh, at CES, Skechers actually introduced a shoe um, that you could play games on it. It had this memory <laughs> game. And so, so kids sitting in a waiting room can actually play games on their shoes. Um, I... Uh, I had, uh, <laughs> in kind of a, a joke, I'd written this piece on, in the future we're going to have what I called arguing shoes. And so all, all the kids would be all the age that would have animatronic shoes with uh, faces on them that um, as you're walking down the mall, uh, your shoes would start trash talking and picking fights with other shoes. <laughs> and, uh, and so it would be kind of a, a fun, interesting dynamic to watch the drama happen between shoes uh, underneath you. So that would uh, – <laughs> is that the kind of smart shoe you're talking about? I'm not sure. Either. I'm not sure either. i just seen smart shoes, and I thought, what is a smart shoe? And I just had a funny image along with that article that you were just talking about. Could you imagine you're in the mall and you're sitting in a bathroom stall and all of a sudden your shoes start arguing with the person that's next to you? (laughs) (laughs) Don't you know you're supposed to just use three sheets? (laughs) 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 Crazy stuff. There there is a, uh, uh, one of the the big companies um, just announced that they had created a shoe that had the the instant lace-up feature from Back to the Future 2. Um, you hit on your hit the button on your shoe and your la- your laces instantly cinch up on them. Hmm. Uh, um, so I mean that's one type of intelligence as well. Um, out at CES there was a company uh, a product called Belty, and it's the the belt you wear around your waist, and it automatically adjusts itself depending on whether you're sitting or standing and how full you are. So you never have to readjust your belt yourself. It does it automatically. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I'm not sure if that's a good thing or a bad thing. It's <laughs> I think things are only as good or bad depending on how someone decides to apply it. Right, right. Um, yeah, but all of the um, all these things are designed with the best of intentions, and people figure out how to use them wrong. Mm-hmm. Um, as an example, one of the, the hot areas at CES was all the flying drones. There was over 100 exhibitors um, in the flying drone space, but the FAA has um, has really clamped down on that. And they, um, they're limiting how much we can do with flying drones right now, and uh, they won't they won't have their operations plan in place until 2017. Um, which is way out in the future, which gives a lot of foreign companies a chance to kind of claim the market. Mm-hmm. So as a result of that, there were a lot of Chinese companies. So the flying flying drones will uh, be another one that, that touches all of our lives. Um, I, I wrote a piece recently on 192 future uses for flying drones, and I started off asking the question, that if you added a video projector to a flying drone, what capabilities would that give you? 
Now, the first ones that came to mind were um, having a concert or some visual arts performance, and um, a drone that flies around with a video jet projector could add some interesting images. But um, then it occurred to me that if you had an individual you wanted to market to, target market something to this individual, you could fly this drone over and shine ads right in front of this person. It could be the most annoying form of advertising ever invented. Oh, uh, brother. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's already bad enough now that you see advertising on cars that are driving down the street. Uh, I actually came to understand, I was reading an article where they're beginning to, where you can actually sell body space and have oh. a tattoo or something like that printed on your body that has to be, you know, in a way that people can see, but you can actually sell your own body space. And uh, how much <laughs> further do we need to be advertised to? <laughs> and even funnier still, because I know here's one to, to, the, that we could talk about now that we're on the subject, but there's the trillion sensor future. And yep. interestingly enough, it was probably about two years ago I picked up a book that had a lot to do with marketing and advertising, but it was a highly entertaining book with this this uh, gentleman had wrote about. And he says, you know, there's a time now, I mean, already as we walk into a store, just imagine you're walking into a Walgreens, of course, the doors slide open just like they do in Star Trek. So, you know, there's an innovation that, you know, happened not too long after the Star Trek series, but... You know, here you are now, you're uh, going and you're scanning your purchases. Of course, nowadays you're putting in your information, such as your telephone number, so you can get those discounts because now you're a rewards member. But then it gets to a point where you're able to walk into the store and now there's personal recognition as you walk in. And it was really funny to read what he wrote about something like that. He says, you know, it's an interesting idea to feel that warm feeling when you walk into, let's say, a Rite Aid to go and get something. But it's quite a different thing, you know, that as you're walking through the door, well, hello, Mr. Johnson, how are you doing today? And by the way, how is that new laxative working out for you? <laughs> 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 but, well, you know, how far do we need to go with the sensors? But let's talk about that one a little bit. <laughs> that's, that's a little too personal there. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> but, um, yeah, the, the um, the roadmap that was created uh, a little over a year ago for our trillion sensor future, they, they're estimating that around 2024 we'll reach a trillion sensors in the world. And then by 2036, it will be 100 trillion. Wow. So we're, we're moving into this exponential growth curve on sensors. What this means is that sensors are becoming very, very tiny, very easy to manufacture, uh, very inexpensive. And we'll start adding them to all the coatings, like paints and powder coatings. And so we'll have, um, we'll be able to get information from the sides of our houses, from the clothes that we're wearing to the sides of buildings or bridges. Um, 3D printers will be able to print sensors into the surface of everything they're printing. Um, and so that gives us information coming off of every surface. Um, so what do we do with all that information? It, it raises some real interesting questions. But uh, as an example, a bridge, we can, we can be monitoring the, the flexing and movement of a bridge as cars drive over it. And over time, then we can tell when it needs repair. Uh, we'll, we'll have advanced warning if this bridge is about to collapse. Um, that, that, I think, is a, a very positive use of it. Um, on the other hand, we can get it run into areas where um, we have way too much information. So um, we're, we're definitely going to have to uh, filter out all the information we have access to because we can only absorb so much. Mm -hmm. Now, there was one, big data. Tell us a little bit more about that since it sounds sort of like we're touching on that. Yeah, um, the big data that we're, we're going to have access to is um, – I mean, all the customer data from uh, people making purchases to um, uh, information about people driving down roads and uh, traffic patterns and things like that. Um, all this information is becoming uh, much more accessible. Now, uh, in some 
unusual cases we find like somebody who is um, um, somebody who purchases a certain type of hammer might also be uh, for some reason interested in taking a vacation in Tahiti. Um, and there's no apparent connection, but for some reason the, that's what the data shows. Um, so there's, there's some real interesting gems that can be mined from all this, this huge data. Um, so this is opening the door for lots of data analysts, for uh, managers of these departments, opens the doors for the tools that they can work with, uh, software programs. And, uh, and so it becomes this very expansive uh, area to think about, um, you know, just because just because we have all this data, uh, how much of, how much of it is usable, and um, and where do we draw the line on privacy and uh, security and things like that? So um, uh, again, it's uh, I, I find it very fascinating, but it's still we're we're still kind of in the um, kind of the Egyptian sundial stage of progression uh, that we've got a long ways to go still on it. Now you bring up, Thomas, a very interesting point about that because we get to a point where as co-creators and creators that we get excited as we begin to develop things such as this. For instance, the commercial drone industry that you were talking about earlier most of what we hear on the news is about how governments are creating these drones that go out and remotely basically destroy little individual communities and so forth. They are under the impression, as you listen through the news, of having the idea they're using drones for constant surveillance on people, so the feeling of a lack of privacy. I mean, here you are sitting perhaps in your backyard enjoying a barbecue, and the next thing you know, you've got this drone that's 50, 60, 100 feet above you, watching everything you're doing, and now you're talking about big data. And as I had mentioned earlier, you know, here you're punching your information into a computer in a store so you can get that discount, but then all of a sudden perhaps there's that voice asking you questions about how you're enjoying the products that you just recently purchased. And you have to wonder, how do you draw the line on something like all this? And the second thing, is it as paranoid as they make us believe it seems to be? Um, actually, fear sells. Um, and so there's, there, there's a lot of fear that's built into everything uh, just because it's an easy marketing tool. Right. Um, if you put fear on the front pages of newspapers, you sell more newspapers. The same with the 6 o'clock news. Um, so if you get people afraid of getting hacked, you sell more. Um, the security software packages, um, that sort of thing. So there, there's a, uh, there is a certain degree of paranoia that's um, that's way overblown. Um, mm -hmm. But um, so we can do a lot of good things with drones. Um, as an example, we have the potential to eliminate forest fires completely. Um, a fire is very easy to put out when it's very small. Um, you know, it's only a few square feet. You can you can stamp it out real easy. But when it turns into a few hundred acres, then it's very difficult to to deal with. So we have the ability to have drones that are scanning all of our forests, and whenever a hot spot first occurs, um, we can send in a fire extinguisher drone to put it out. Um, so we have that ability today to do that. It'd still be pretty crude, but um, that's easy to envision. Um, cities, whenever there's an incident inside of a city, uh, the first response will be to send up uh, a drone to get eyes on it. And so once they have eyes on a situation, whether it's a kidnapping situation or um, somebody robbing a bank or a car crash or a plane crash, uh, they get eyes on it and they know how to formulate that response then. Um, there's, there's tons and tons of positive uses. Um, Amazon wants to start delivering packages with drones and I mean how cool is it that you can order something and then 10 minutes later a drone drops a package at your front door and, and you have it right there. Um, that 
that I think is quite fascinating. Um, but at the same time, there's, there's certain dangers. Um, the same drone that can be delivering pizza to your house can also be delivering poison or, or bombs or, or be spying on your kids. Mm -hmm. um, so, so those are some of the things that the FAA is aware of, uh, the problems in trying to regulate those issues. Um, just, uh, I, I also made a, an interesting prediction that, you know, there's always been all this talk about where's my flying car, uh, how long do I have to wait for a flying car. I've actually concluded that we will never get to a flying car era. Um, actually, the first flying car was invented in 1917, the Curtis Air Car. But when somebody asks about a flying car, what they're really asking about is, is there something that's going to be affordable like the average person's uh, car in their garage that anybody can afford, that the average person can get behind the wheel and steer it through the sky, and, um, and uh, it'll be no noiseless and easy to operate and all that. The, the reality is, is that uh, I don't want all the people that are driving cars to be up in the sky. Uh, <laughs> well, I know. It's just uh, it's batted up on the linear surface two-dimensionally <laughs> to get people to drive. And I thought yeah. to myself, you know, how do you construct roadways, highways, streets, and avenues in the air? I mean, people are kind of idiots down here as it is. <laughs> <laughs> so, so rather than getting into a flying car era, what we will get into is the flying drone era where people get into a drone and it takes them to where they want to go. Um, let's let's take take the human variables out of the equation, and then we'll be fine with it. Mm -hmm. So 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 that's my conclusion that we will never get to a flying car era. Now, does that go along the line with the driverless everything? Um, yeah, um, it, it does. Um, so imagine um, ten, fifteen years in the future, you step out in front of your house. You pull out your smartphone, you punch in, you want to go to school, you want to go to work, you want to go shopping, a uh, driverless vehicle picks you up, takes you to where you want to go, drops you off, and from there it picks somebody else up and takes them to where they want to go. Um, so it transitions us, this is on-demand transportation, it transitions us from a just-in-case mindset, I have a car in my garage just in case I need to go somewhere, to a just-in-time mindset. Um, now that that's basically uh, how the sharing economy is getting started here too. Um, I mean, the sharing economy says that um, I have tools in my garage just in case, in case I need to build something. I have appliances in my kitchen in case I want to prepare a meal. Um, but if you could summon these things, you go from just in just in case to just in time. If rather than having uh, an electric drill in my garage. I can summon it, and a flying drone brings it to me in 10 minutes. I can use it and then send it back. Um, that's, uh, that changes the equation dramatically. We don't have to own so much stuff then. Right. Um, so rather than having a car in a garage, um, that, uh, uh, but driverless cars are going to be introduced in baby steps, um, one, one step at a time. And uh, it'll be features, you know, like we had power steering, we have cruise control, and we're going to have some driverless features. So some of the early, one of the earliest drivers, driverless features will be an auto valet service. So you pu pull your car up in front of a crowded restaurant, you get out of the car and tell your car to go park itself. Um, and then once you come back out of the restaurant, rather than getting into a car that smells like uh, cheap perfume and lipstick all over the seats, then you just uh, you just whistle and your car comes back to you and takes you back to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people love that 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 scenario. You know, um, and it, it's also fascinating too, Thomas, because when you know, as people listen to the program, they'll think, "Well, that's that's out there, that's down the road." But let's combine the two. Uh, of course, we don't really have the driverless car quite yet, unless you consider a taxi cab a driverless car. But we really actually have the app and the car itself, uh, as they have like cars to go, for instance. There's an app that you can have on your cell phone that you punch that, so you don't even need to own a car anymore. But you punch this, 
It tells you where the closest car to go is. You go, you pick this thing up, scan it with whatever, with a key or however it is that you get into this, and you borrow a car for as long as you need to, and then you go ahead and you drop it off, and then, of course, it knows where the location is. And so they get into what we, we did this on the program about two years ago. It was called meshing. In other words, we're now becoming a sharing society. We don't really own things, so to speak, anymore, but we have things to share with others. And I thought that was a very unique way to go about things because think about it. If you own a car, how often does it really sit idle doing nothing? Yeah, 95% of the time usually. Mm -hmm. um, uh, most cars get used 5% or less of the day. Um, and so it's a very expensive use of human resources um, because it's mostly idle. But if you have uh, a driverless vehicle that you can summon, those vehicles might get used as much as oh, 85, 90% of the day. Wow. Um, always being in circulation, and uh, just when when people need a need a ride, they're they're there. Um, so, as, uh, part of um, the the way the driverless world is going to evolve is that the trucking world is going to adopt it earlier than uh, um, than regular uh, car passengers. Uh, the trucking world has great difficulty hiring enough. Uh, drivers for the over-the-road trucks. And so uh, the agriculture world has had steering assist on tractors for since 2009. And so if you can think of, imagine steering assist on trucks that you, you pull the rig out onto the interstate, they put it in autopilot, and then the driver plate turns around in his seat and he plays video games and watches movies for the next 10 hours. Um, that becomes a rather interesting scenario. More likely, the driver will turn around and have a computer there where he, where he goes to work doing other types of work while the, the truck is traveling. And when it gets to uh, the city where he's going, then he pulls it off and puts it in driver mode again. Now, that's an interim step. Uh, eventually, we'll get to so that things can be all driverless, but it'll take a while. Mm -hmm. You know, it's fascinating, too, when you think about automation. And what comes to mind for me was another documentary that I found called Our Daily Bread. And in this, uh, it was a fascinating documentary because it contained no dialogue, no nothing whatsoever. You were just watching as you see how food is produced. And one of the things they showed is they had this, Banning shot at night where you see this very large glow off in the horizon, and as they and this was in the evening, and so as you got closer, you realized this is a greenhouse that looked like it was easily almost a half a mile long. Then they go into this greenhouse and it shows you, for instance, rows of tomatoes and machinery that goes along and sprays and waters these things has yeah. sensors to decide when the tomato is ripe enough for harvesting with no manpower whatsoever. And I thought, wow, <laughs> there's something to think about. Yeah, yeah. automating um, the, the ag world is, is happening on an ongoing basis. Um, now, all of the mature industries are being forced to do more with less on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. And so adding that level of automation eliminates all the, uh, the manpower and the wages that have to be paid along the way. Mm -hmm. um, at, at CES, uh, they had some uh, 3D printers that worked with food. Um, one, one of the new ones that um, its uh, 3D systems is, uh, joint, is partnering with Hershey's to make one called CocoJet, which is printing with chocolate. And, um, and so you can actually get your face scanned in and have your face printed in chocolate. Well, how about uh, that? Yeah, apparently there's a pent-up demand for people love to eat their faces. <laughs> <laughs> then after that, you go into the bathroom so your shoes can argue over which face tastes the best. <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, it's all crazy stuff. Now, 
Energy is one of the big things, too, uh, that we have uh, going on. Natural gas, wind power, and solar power. We're beginning to take a look at moving possibly away from fossil fuels. Tell us about the innovations that we can anticipate in those three areas. Yeah, the um, the whole energy space is, um, well, it's a very complicated space because you have uh, vehicles, which everybody associates with power, and then you have the, the energy for the home. Um, the cars are, uh, the electric cars are catching on, um, uh, not because they're as good as gas-powered cars, but because they are better. Um, what you do is you eliminate 90% of the moving parts in a vehicle, uh, to create an electric vehicle, and they've overcome the problems of, of range. Now we're able to get uh, Tesla has announced uh, cars that will go up to 400 miles and can be recharged uh, far faster than ever before. Um, and so these, these vehicles are becoming cheaper to operate, and, um, and they're uh, more responsive. The, there's, there's uh, Teslas that have um, been in a race with a Ferrari and uh, uh, made kind of a fool out of the Ferrari. Um, so going zero to 60 in 3.2 seconds is uh, nothing to scoff at. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. so but but they they're able to get so much market share because they're actually better than anything um, that's in the, uh, the the gas powered arena. Um, so when you think about taking homes off grid, um, and by the way, uh, the state of Florida has decided that it's going to be illegal to take homes off grid down there for whatever reason. Yeah, we um, can guess why that is. <laughs> um, it has something to do with uh, the lobbyists for the power company, I think. But, um, but the the idea that we can actually take houses off grid, uh, we we need to create. Uh, a self-sufficient house that's better than being on the grid. Um, uh, the power is that we have to our house is pretty reliable. It doesn't go down very often. Um, the systems that we have are pretty stabilized. They're pretty good. So um, I think about the, the, the smart house of the future, one that we can get to this whole self-sufficient house, one where we can... Um, we can suck power out of the air and store it in batteries, and then we have power all the time that we need it. We can also suck moisture out of the air, and so we have reserve tanks of water, so we have water whenever we need it. Um, having uh, a composting system and built-in sewage systems that you can operate inside your house, and so the house becomes self-sufficient. And um, and then with with certain advanced growing systems for the house, and you can also grow all your own uh, uh, food supplies as well. Mm -hmm. um, that is is actually becoming much more conceivable now. Um, uh, but uh, lest anybody think that we're creating some sort of a utopia, it's just not the case. It's just different. It's um, but creating a self-sufficient house that doesn't require that you alter your lifestyle dramatically. I think is um, that's kind of been one of the holy grails of the house uh, house movement. Now, mass energy storage is another thing that we can uh, anticipate on the horizon. And I was thinking about this because it wasn't too long ago that I was to the understanding that in Europe, Germany specifically, there was a town that actually got to that level that you're talking about, where houses are energy self sufficient. They they've kind of pulled off the grid, so to speak. And yeah. what was fascinating about what I was hearing about this is, so here you're in your home, you're able to create energy for yourself, able to store that energy to a point where there was a surplus. And what had happened is, then you're able to take that extra energy that you're not using and actually resell it back into the grid. And apparently this created a surplus revenue of several millions of dollars a year. So you were literally creating a whole new economic industry out of just finding ways to be more energy efficient in your home. Um, yeah, there's lots of uh, experimentation that's happening with the mass energy storage space. Um, 
scientist uh, from MIT, this Donald Sadaway, has um, developed this idea around uh, creating liquid metal batteries that they're um, actually building inside of the uh, inside of shipping containers. Um, so cities then can um, buy a series of these shipping container size batteries and store them, uh, stack them up, um, and then that becomes a backup power supply for the city. Um, so the, the, the big trend is uh, for communities to transition from being on a national grid to being a microgrid. Um, so these microgrids then will be community-based, um, city-based, uh, and have backup systems like that so they don't have to rely on a national grid then. Um, that, <coughs> that will be a transition happening over the coming decades. And, um, so the, uh, the mass energy storage is, is just one, um, one of the, the pieces of the equation you have. You have the generation, the storage, the transmission, and uh, there's, there's other areas of the power uh, industry that are um, uh, be under constant scrutiny as well. But uh, it's, it's one of our big expenses in life is uh, is power, um, and and so the the more that we can make it available and uh, economical for everybody. Um, it's one of the big drivers of our economy. Mm -hmm. Now, as you were talking about the driverless car, you know, and then eventually people take a look at the electric car and they realize, well, you know, these things may not go as fast or as far as I would like them to, much like maybe a muscle car, for instance. You have to scratch your head and say, well, how fast do you need to get somewhere? But hyperspeed transportation systems, I mean, you know, in Japan, their train, the bullet train, is just amazingly fast. But this is something quite different we're talking about here. Uh, this is more of vacuum tube transportation. Yeah. Um, uh, the world started paying attention to this when Elon Musk announced uh, his plans for Hyperloop. Um, and uh, it's a tube transportation system. So if you if you take... Uh, a tube and you take all the air out of it, you create a vacuum, and then you put a maglev track on the bottom, um, there's virtually no friction whatsoever in that. So in, in Colorado we have uh, an alternative to, um, to the Hyperloop. It's a company called ET3, Evacuated Tube Transportation. Um, and they are they're working on uh, uh, this model of tube transportation where people can actually go uh, over 4,000 miles an hour. Um, and uh, they, they talk, refer to it as space travel on Earth. Um, so once you're able to achieve those type of speeds, then it's entirely possible to travel from New York to Beijing in less than two hours. Um, and that's, that becomes a real interesting scenario because we could start building uh, this new form of infrastructure. And, and by the way, um, we will need large infrastructure projects like this to keep all the people of the world employed in the future. So setting our sights on a project like this, this could actually be like a 50-year build-out employing literally hundreds of millions of people around the world to create this. And, uh, and, uh, and it would uh, enable us to travel at super fast speeds um, and so sometime in the future, uh, you envision people being able to have breakfast in New York, lunch in Tokyo, and then dinner in Paris. Um, we become a very fluid society, um, and we can move around uh, just on a whim if we need to. Which takes us to the 24-hour cities. I mean, Las Vegas won't be the only one anymore. No. Um, We'll be able to operate uh, uh, 24 hours a day wherever we're at. Um, not only having vending machines that we can access at any time of the day, but we can actually, if we need something, we just order it and we have drones that deliver it to us uh, uh, any time of the day. Um, so we can be functional and operating. You know, Nothing really closes down then. 
and, uh, and the automation enables us to to be functional whenever we care to be. Um, so that 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 gives us an, an entirely different type of way of looking at the world because right now it's just kind of uh, sun up to sundown, and then then some people enjoy the nightlife, but um, it's it, it's really regulated by the clock heavily. Mm -hmm. um, so we take some of the barriers out of out of it, and people can kind of sync up to whatever schedule works best for them. And that's a, that's a radically different world. Well, it certainly is that you know, combined with the fact that you have the hyperspeed transportation, you have the application that can find you a car to use once you're there. It's really quite fascinating how transportation and the 24-hour city dynamically change the way we do things. Yeah, um, all of these are, uh, are just adding to uh, the, the technology that's all around us. Um, so where does this lead? Where, where is this taking us? Is this creating a better grade of humans? Does it solve all the, the problems that we have? Um, it, I'm sure it doesn't solve all the problems. It probably creates a lot of new ones. And uh, But uh, they're, they're going to happen whether whether we give it our blessing or not. <laughs> right. Uh, so so I think there's, there's a certain percentage of the populations that I refer to as the habitual problem solvers. Mm -hmm. And these are people that are always figuring out a better way to do things. And those are the people that are constantly driving society forward. Mm -hmm. uh, they're never satisfied with the way it is today, that there's always a better way of doing things. And um, I find that inspiring, though. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, the other thing, too, is you take a look at, for instance, a typical day of a person and how much energy they spend just so they can feed themselves and relax. Most people, when they want to, for instance, build wealth, they want to become wealthy, one of the biggest reasons they want to do that is so that they can buy back their time. Exactly. You know, and now we're, you know, moving, as you're describing here, into these uh, innovative industries that are up and coming, and pretty much most of them are here anyway. And you have to start asking yourself, well, what if you now had that shortcut where you don't have to build the wealth, but now you're able to have that time that you originally wanted to build your wealth for? Did you have any ideas what you wanted to do with that time? After all, you can only sit on a beach so much. You can only vacation so much. What's next? Right. I spend a lot of time talking about uh, the prime directive, which is, you know, the Star Trek term that uh, I think Star Trek got it all wrong, but uh, uh, run the risk of alienating lots of Star Trek fans. Um, but you know, if we're uh, eliminating lots of jobs, um, you have the negative eliminating jobs. You have the positive of freeing up human capital. So if we have lots of available human capital, how do we apply it uh, in the future? What are the big things that still need to be accomplished in the world? And um, it is kind of this big overarching question I love to ask because uh, there are uh, huge projects that we can set our sights on. Um, in a recent column I wrote about uh, uh, the, the laws of exponential capabilities um, every time we can do something easier, we can do more of it. Um, so if we have something that saves our time, then we can we can do ten times as much stuff. So the accomplishments uh, that we think are big accomplishments today, you know, were they're much simpler to do than they were 50 years ago. Sure. And in the future, we can probably accomplish a hundred times what people were able to accomplish 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and and so what are the big things that we should be setting our sights on? And so like a, building a tube transportation network, that's a huge project. That one, uh, that was kind of this grandiose surrounding the world, the biggest infrastructure project of all times type thing. I, I find that, that type of thing fascinating because it's within our grasp. We can actually envision it. We can actually tackle something like that. Um, and so what should we be colonizing other planets? Should we be sending probes to the center of the earth? Uh, how do we create inexhaustible power supplies? 
um, inexhaustible food supplies, things like that. Um, those are all challenges that are hanging out there that uh, that we need to look at. And even more importantly, too, as you consider the 24-hour city, you now have the 24-hour church where you can ask God, what do I do next? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there you Although go. I wouldn't want a 24-hour evangelical program blurring through my television, but that's been here for the last 60 years anyway, so... Yeah, you don't want a 24-hour church service yet. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thomas, it's always a pleasure to have you here on the program today again. You know, it's interesting when we, it reminds me of the scene of the first movie of Jurassic Park where the, I guess the theoretical scientist says, you know, you were so busy worrying about whether or not that you could do this thing, you never thought for a minute whether or not you should. You know, right. because you really don't know as you step in this direction and these innovations happen. And as you said, they're going to happen anyway. There's nothing you can do about it. You can't sit around and debate this thing. All you yeah. can do is adapt to it as it happens and decide what's next. Yeah, there's there's a lot of, a lot of jobs opening up for ethicists that ask the can we should be problem um, because we need to – There's there's a philosophical – debate that needs to occur with lots of technologies. Um, and it's, it's really not about um, uh, should we do it, it's about how do we manage it better. Mm -hmm. um, because virtually every new technology needs to be managed in some, some shape or form. Um, and that will be some of our challenges in the future. Here. No doubt about that, but I think just like anything else, we've found a way, haven't we? Yeah, we're getting there. <laughs> <laughs> well, Thomas, thank you so much for joining us on the program. And for our listeners, give out a website they can find out more and they can explore this. Because who knows, our listeners may be some of yeah. those innovators that might be on the horizon doing things we could have never imagined. Um, a lot of the stuff that I write is on futurespeaker.com. Uh, so lots of, I, I post all my columns on there. Uh, anybody who's interested in our micro-college programs at Da Vinci Coders, it's just davincicoders.com. And then uh, the institute itself is just at davinciinstitute.com. Very good. And you can pick up your free pair of smart shoes if you would subscribe with their subscribe newsletter service today. <laughs> <laughs> Thomas, thank you so much for joining us here on the program. All right. Thank you. Uh, have a great day. You too. We want to thank you, the listeners out there, for tuning in. You can also find out more by visiting us at beyond50radio.com. That is the number 50. I'm Daniel Davis. Thank you for tuning in. And remember, live your day past halfway.